Good morning, St. Michael's. My name is Yang, and I'll be serving as your online chaplain today. I'll be with you in the chat, both on Zoom and on Facebook. A warm welcome to all of you, especially if you're visiting with us today. We are eager to greet you and learn how God is at work in your life. So stay tuned. We'll say more about that later in the service. And if you're joining us from home, and you'd like to symbolically participate in the sacred meal of the Eucharist, find something simple to eat and drink, and keep an eye on the chat for further instructions. Now, as we prepare ourselves for worship, take a breath and let yourself rest here in God's presence. Come, let us worship God together. Blessed be God, most holy, glorious, and undivided Trinity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
May God be with you. Let us pray. O God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Good morning, St. Michael's. My name is Barry Wilson. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, wait here for us until we come to you again. For Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. The word of the Lord.
Good morning, St. Michael's. My name is Gregory Bryant. Our second reading is from the second letter of Peter. We do not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord, Jesus Christ. But we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father, whom that voice was conveyed to him by the, by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from the heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. We will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. First of all, you must understand this that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever comes, ever came by human will. But men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoken from God. The word of the Lord.
Please be seated. I had a mountaintop experience on an actual mountaintop once. Uh, nestled in the shores of Saranac Lake in upstate New York, I was attending a Christian retreat for high school kids. Now, high school kids are notoriously difficult to impress, uh, so this camp uh, took out, pulled out all the stops uh, to try to impress high school kids with a super cool daily routine of the most exciting outdoor activities. We went parasailing and there was a ropes course and there was a swimming pool with this 50 foot water slide. Uh, it was, for a high school kid, it was pretty cool. Um, but these thrilling activities which were designed to help us enjoy the great outdoors and God's good creation were not really the transformative part of the week, for me at least. Um, it was the nightly talks where a pastor would talk to us about faith. I was really transfixed by this message, so much so that one night I found myself waiting until the hundreds of kids had left the auditorium. <clears throat> I kind of lingered behind, wanting to talk to this pastor. Um, and I confessed to him that I'd really been feeling rather distant from God at that point. I think I was a senior in high school. Um, I mean, I, I grew up going to church and I was a pretty good kid. Um, and then I did things that a lot of high school kids do. Um, and it had pulled me away from, from God and feeling close to God and like I was in alignment with who God wanted me to be. Um, and I told this pastor as such, his talks had made me realize just how distant that I had gotten, and I wanted to reconnect to God after hearing these messages throughout the week, and I just really didn't, didn't know how. Um, and so he listened very gently, and then he grabbed a scrap of paper and scribbled something on it and handed it to me and said, take this, get your Bible, and go find a quiet place to sit somewhere and read it. So I looked at the paper, and it had this one simple question written on it, it said, how does God feel about Julie? Luke 15, 11 to 32. <laughs> Some of you are giggling because you probably know what that citation is. I did not at the time yet. Um, although with my Bible in hand, I, you know, I climbed onto a little rock that overlooked this beautiful lake. And under the moonlight, I opened to the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 11. And I was only one sentence in when I realized that I was reading the parable of the prodigal son. And as the soft evening, I'm going to cry just thinking about that. It was a very, did not expect this to happen. Wow. It was really powerful. I'm, here I am, I'm 30 years later, and I'm still overcome with how powerful that moment was. I didn't do this at 745, Juanita. I don't know why I'm getting teary now. <laughs> Oof. But as that soft evening breeze whispered through those trees, it felt like God herself was whispering to me to return, to return home to God's loving arms. And I wept like I am now uh, and like never before. I mean, I was 17. Right? Never before in scripture just felt so deeply personal and alive. Never before had God's unconditional love felt like it was for me too. It was a tremendous mountaintop moment on a literal mountaintop. And it was a profound experience of God's loving presence in my life. It was transformative. And I climbed down from that rock feeling like a new person, completely different person. And I returned home from that retreat with this like vigor and joy that I had not felt in a long time. And a few days after I had returned home, I was telling my mom all about this how amazing this retreat was, how much it had changed me, how like on fire for God I was. And she said, yeah, I remember going on those kinds of retreats and coming home feeling like that when I was your age. You come home on this spiritual high and it feels good. It doesn't last though. Something like that. It may not have been her exact words, but it was definitely something to that effect. And I was like, ew. <laughs> like, way to harsh my buzz. I was so annoyed. <laughs> um, it just felt like she was totally invalidating that experience. Like, thanks for being a buzzkill. But of course, you and I know she was right. 
Those mountaintop moments are profound, but they are fleeting. And I think that is why Peter and James and John wanted so desperately to capture that mountaintop moment with Jesus. This Messiah, this leader that they had been following, someone who would cause a lot of stir, quite a bit of controversy, was revealed for who he really was. He was God, God's son, God incarnate, literally standing there in front of them, dazzling with God's voice booming down from the clouds. I mean, who can blame them, right, for wanting to capture that moment, that glory forever? Religion is designed in some ways to give us mountaintop moments. Sometimes I worry that can be where religion fails us. It gives us the mountaintop. It gives us an escape from the valleys and the harshness of the world that we live in. We worship in a sanctuary, literally, legally, this is a safe space, right? People can get, find sanctuary, safety, in this very building. We construct temples and sacred spaces and we erect works of art and Tiffany stained glass windows and ancient liturgies and beautiful hymns, all that are comforting and beautiful and ancient. And for a brief moment, we can celebrate the diversity and the goodwill here and have a break from the brokenness that surrounds us. But as much as religion acknowledges the valleys that we inhabit, I wonder sometimes if it truly prepares us for them. I wonder if we come to religion for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Like Peter, James, and John, we would prefer, I think, to set up camp in the safe and happy places. I know I would. We're still living, my friends, in the valley of the shadow of a pandemic, in the dark shadows of police brutality where unarmed black men continue to be murdered, in the sinister wells of white supremacy, in the literal earth-shattering devastation of earthquakes and other natural disasters, in the valleys of our own grief and fear and anxiety. I don't know about you, but those are some valleys that I would be very happy for Jesus to lead me out of and away from. But like my mother said to me so many years ago, Jesus says to his disciples, get up. And when they look up, it's all gone. What a buzzkill Jesus was. I think he learned from my mom. How disappointed the disciples must have felt. I can relate. Their Lord and Savior gave them this amazing moment of grace, and it was so fleeting, they were barely able to enjoy it before he forced them to get up and face reality. The tension point of the transfiguration is that Jesus leads his disciples up to a mountaintop, and then he leads them back down, away from it. He leads them to something glorious and wonderful, and then he leads them back into the valley, back to the place where there is illness and poverty and devastation and all manner of difficulty. The disappointing truth is that if we follow Jesus, all of our mountaintop moments will end. But is that really disappointing? Let us not forget what really happened on that mountaintop so many years ago. Jesus' disciples had a profound transformative moment with their Lord and Savior, a moment where they experienced the deep love and abiding hope and steadfast faith that Jesus gives us. And they want to remain in that moment, on that mountaintop. And Jesus says, no, you can't stay here. And if that was all that Jesus had said, it would have been very disappointing indeed. But that's not all he says. The gospel account says that as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus spoke again to them. Jesus does not send them back down the mountain alone. He accompanies them. And not only does he accompany them, he leads them. He says, follow me back down that mountain. And together, let's get to work. 
Last week, Father Frank gave us a good word and reminded us that the greatest gift that God gives us is the power to make choices. I took notes, Frank. I wonder how each of us, in our own way, consciously or not, chooses the mountaintop and avoids the valley. I know there are valleys I would like to avoid. But we are about to enter the season of Lent, a time when we often take up a particular practice or discipline. I know you may, if you, if you are a church person, you get accustomed to hearing, so what are you giving up for Lent? I wanna put that language aside for a moment, but I do want us to consider what our Lenten disciplines might be. And as we do that, I wonder, how will you encounter the world more in all of its brokenness? What can you do that will build the practice of walking into the world with Jesus by your side? How will you let Jesus lead you and trust that even if it is to a place you do not want to go, that he is there with you all the way? It might not feel like good news to know that Jesus does not lead us to mountaintops and let us just stay there. But it is good news that he leads us no matter the altitude. The promise is true. God will not leave us or forsake us. And so friends, let us walk into the valley together. Amen. Please stand. And together, whether you're on a mountain top or you're in the valley, we always remember to affirm our faith through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not man, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in one Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. He is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Hello, St. Michael's. My name is Deborah Houston, and I am here to lead you in the prayers of the people. When I say, light of the world, please respond, hear our prayer. God of light and life, our prayers rise before you this day in hope and faith. We pray for your church, for your diocese, bishops, clergy, and all people, for our partner parish St. Peter's in Eaton Square, London, and for our friends at St. Luke's Church and School, Martel Haiti, for the mission of the church throughout the world on this Global Mission Sunday.
flame of abundant love, be our joy in proclaiming your good news to the world. Light of the world, we pray for all who are coming to faith, all who wonder about faith, all who are struggling with faith. Source of all creation, guide us to lead, teach, and nurture your disciples. Light of the world, we pray for those in need of food, shelter, clothing, and of God's healing touch, and those for whom our prayers are especially desired the Howard McNeil family, Brenda, Matilda, Yorma, and family, River, Rebecca, Shane, Joyce, Francisco, Maria, Michael, Lynn, Alan and family, Peter, <laughs> Keith. We pray also for those who have died especially Joyce McNeil. Comforter of the suffering, warm our hands to loving service, light of the world. We pray for the world, especially where there is trouble and suffering far away or nearby. Ember of steadfast care, fuel our passion to challenge injustice and violence and to pursue peace and reconciliation. Light of the world. We pray for the land on which we stand, the peoples, creatures, plant life, and waters around us. Star blaze of glory, lead us to care for this fragile earth, our island home, and to heal the circle of creation, light of the world. God of radiant light, your love illumines our hopes before we know them and our needs before we ask. Kindle your flame within us, that in our prayers and service, we may know your transforming presence at work in the world around us. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all earth. We confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied our goodness in, each other, in ourselves and in the world we have created. We repent of the evil that has left us, the evil we have done, the evil we have done. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Well done. Good.
All right, well, let's bless the children as they return from their uh, children's worship time. Hi, kids. So today you learned about John Lewis. Ooh. And he believed that everyone had a spark of the divine in them. Everyone has a spark of God inside of them. And he said that not all trouble was the same. Do you guys get into trouble yes. sometimes? Right? But That's humor. he said that pushing back against bad laws was good trouble. Our prayer is that the saints who have gone before us are a light reminding us and encouraging us that everybody has dignity and that it is okay to push back against bad laws. Sometimes it's okay to make good trouble. I bless you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now, friends, walk in love as Christ loves us, an offering and a sacrifice for us all.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give you thanks, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Because in the mystery of the world, the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, of the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. For in these last days you sent Jesus to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In Christ you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you, in Christ, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember Christ's death, we proclaim, we await Christ's coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Savior of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray, your gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us all in Jesus, in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, through whom we are acceptable to you, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your cross, and bring us to that heavenly country where with Mary the God-bearer, St. Joseph, St. Michael, St. Jude, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your children through Jesus Christ, our Savior, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of salvation, by Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. As our Savior Christ has told us, we now pray.
wherever you are in your Christian journey, whether you're on the mountain top, whether you're in the valley, the arms of God are always open through Christ. He says, come, come unto me, for these are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
time for us to pray for the Eucharistic, the lay Eucharistic visitors as they come for a prayer. We can't do anything until Rick gets here. <laughs> Let us pray. In the name of St. Michael's Church, I send you forth bearing these holy gifts, that those to whom you go may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We who are many are one. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with this hospital food of the most precious life. Savior Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for announcements. Good morning, St. Michael's. Nice to be with you this morning. A spe special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us. Uh, we want you to know you are warmly welcomed here at St. Michael's, and if you uh, are new to us and want to know a little bit more about us, whether you're here in person or joining us online, um, if you are here in person and you have a bulletin, there are some QR codes on the back that can lead you to further information about St. Michael's Church, and if you are joining us online, you'll see some announcements in the chat about how to connect uh, deeper with us. We'd love to know more about you and uh, where God is moving in your life and how we can be a part of that journey. I'm going to try to burn through the rest of these announcements because there are quite a few today. Um, we mentioned briefly in our prayers that today is Global Mission Sunday, and that may be one of those things that can feel a bit detached from what we do on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, daily basis here at St. Michael's, but the truth is we are very involved in the church's wider global mission. We pray every week for our ministry and our partnership in Haiti. Uh, we have a partner in Uganda um, who we send support to. We have supported uh, the Ali uh, Hospital in Gaza that supports children, victims of the war, and especially uh, globally and nationally, Episcopal Relief and Development, the relief arm of our church, makes a dynamic difference in the world at various disaster sites everywhere. In particular, I wanna call your attention to their work currently in Syria and Turkey to deliver relief to earthquake victims there. If you are wondering how to help, uh, we've been hearing that we're not sure what, how help exactly gets to the ground. We have it on good word that Episcopal Relief and Development is getting aid on the ground where it is needed. Um, so they are a good place to, to donate to if you would like to provide earthquake support. Now, as I mentioned in the sermon, we are coming up fast on the season of Lent, that 40-day period of fasting and penitence and um, just calling to mind our own brokenness, our own sinfulness, preparing for Easter when we celebrate the resurrection. Um, so to prepare for Lent, we have to uh, gorge ourselves on pancakes. So on Tuesday night, uh, we are having our annual Shrove Tuesday Pancake Supper here. A suggested donation is $15 in advance and $20 at the door. Again, that's a suggested donation. Um, not required if uh, 
you are unable to meet that, but just uh, there will be tickets being sold at the back of the church. It does help to get tickets ahead of time. Not only do you save money, it helps us get an accurate head count so we can make sure there are plenty of pancakes for everybody involved. Uh, we will also be burning last year's palms. Um, I heard from a friend, from a clergy colleague this week, that there has been some chatter amongst non-church people about what exactly is comprised in the ashes that go on your forehead on Ash Wednesday. Um, so to just dispel any rumors, they're not human remains. They are actually... <laughs> I was a little shocked when I heard this, but anyway, apparently that's going around. They are last year's palms that we burn at the Shrove Tuesday Pancake Supper. Um, and the kids gather around a big fire pit. Who doesn't love fire, right? And we burn them, and those are the ashes that we use the very next day um, for Ash Wednesday. So that is also to say, if you have dried up palms from last year, we need them. Bring them Tuesday night. Thank you so much. Now, the following day, Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, our church doors will be open from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Well, 8 p.m., 8 to 8 uh, for the imposition of ashes, if you are a person whose day is busy and you can't stay for a whole service, please come by, say some prayers, get your ashes. You are also most welcome to join us at noon or 7 p.m. for our Ash Wednesday services. Uh, there is a lot coming up in Lent. I'm not going to go into that, but make sure you do keep your eye on this week's email, which will tell you all about all the Lenten offerings that are to come. Last but not least, we have a bit of a bittersweet moment and a farewell to say today. Um, Barry and Katie have uh, decided to leave New York, which is a bad decision, and <laughs> <laughs> our, uh, <laughs> uh, we will heartily miss you, but uh, it is our custom here at St. Michael's that we offer a parting blessing to those who are relocating elsewhere. Barry and Katie have been a dynamic part of this community for a long time. Um, can I embarrass you a little bit and ask you to come forward so we can all extend a blessing to you and send you on your way? Now, I would love to come up there, but the microphone is here, so come, come close. And um, it is, of course, our St. Michael's custom that we... You can actually come on up, come on up, come on up. And Frank, you can lay hands, and, and everybody just extend a palm forward, palm up, right? <clears throat> Barry and Katie, live without fear. Your creator has made you holy, has always protected you, and loves you as a mother. Go in peace to follow the good road, and may God's blessing be with you always. Amen. Amen. We will miss you. Thank you. Barry asked if he could say a few words, and um, he assured me it would be 90 seconds long, which I, I really, I'm going to time you, Barry. Do you want up, Barry? Go up to the microphone so we can all hear you. There's a lot of emotion. The 216 years of permanence here is pretty amazing. The saints that are in those pews and the ones over the last three years that we've lost. Remind me of the dove, and they're praying for us in heaven, and they're praying in our midst. The saints and miracles that we don't realize are among us every day, whether that's Juanita Pratt's prayers. I could go on all day, I, I promise I won't. Juanita Jones' faith, Frank's preaching, Julie's transparency and heart for all of us. I think in this gospel today, it said, get up and do not be afraid. I think we have to thank the vestry for realizing the ability to be surprised by the Holy Spirit and what we've done. Those saints like Edgar and Naomi and Gail Sheedy that have gone, and the things that we've lost, <laughs> including my mother-in-law, have been significant. But the gains that we've gotten, this church touches so many people in so many ways that I didn't realize, and 
I ask for your forgiveness. Be open to that Holy Spirit and to be surprised. I heard this at a sermon in Savannah where this is going to be our home and we have so much to be thankful for. We so believe in the Episcopal Church in that redemption and resurrection and renewal. There's some people that know me really well that knew me in that valley. <laughs> and now Michael and Mary Ellen Lehman and thank you so much for so many things that you know. And I'm so glad that they're going to be sharing it with you. I want to leave with what Martin Minns used to tell us in pretty much every sermon he ever told us. Was, grace is truly God's redemption at Christ's expense. I hope to be a better man of God, a better husband, a better friend. But know that St. Michael's arms are everywhere from the priests that we've sent out, from the people in the pews. And those doors wide open just remain open to be surprised because you're greeting saints every day. And my wife Katie and I are so thankful to have been in your midst for 10 years. We will, you will be in our hearts, in our, definitely in our prayers. And as we try to find a home, it's going to be hard to replace this one. God bless you all. Our loss is Savannah's gain. Please stand for our final blessing. Please just to emphasize that on Wednesday we are here again at 7 for the service, Ash Wednesday. So please come as we start this journey together. May the blessing of God, of Abraham and Sarah, and of Jesus Christ, born of our sister Mary, and of the Holy Spirit who broods over the world as a mother over her children, be upon you, remain with you, now and always.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.